A very good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us on this webinar for model-based design in developing and testing medical devices. My name is Ravali Kantamraju, or uh, I go by Ravali, which is easier. And I'm an application engineer working at MathWorks. Uh, I'm based out of the Texas office, and uh, a lot of my work is surrounding the medical device industry. Um, academically speaking, my background is in biomedical engineering. I did a lot of image processing analysis and um, deep learning work in, in grad school. And then uh, I went on to work with Ventana Medical Systems uh, with fluorescent images uh, for uh, uh, cancer images and all of that. And currently, uh, at my position in MathWorks, I, I deal with a lot of medical device customers um, who develop uh, uh, different diagnostic and therapeutic devices, and I focus on the simulation side of things. So for today's webinar, I will be talking about uh, Simulink and Simscape and the other uh, uh, the graphical-based uh, user interface products of MathWorks. Uh, feel free to throw in the que uh, questions you have into the Q&A section or the chat window. Uh, we'll monitor them towards the end. Uh, thank you, more. Um, so I guess we'll get started. Um, so then we have enough time for Q&A as well. Uh, so at a high level, seeing that we have the first slide up, what is model-based design? So a lot of folks in any industry are basically aiming to accelerate any kind of process that they're working on, whether it's testing with their uh, components and devices, or if it's even to figure out what kind of a behavior causes a certain flaw or what kind of behavior makes a, a product better. So model-based design is a process that will help you accelerate testing and uh, simulating your uh, processes in order to arrive at your final product in a quicker manner. So for today's webinar, uh, the agenda is that I walk you guys through a small demonstration of, uh, of, of a medical device. Uh, and the example that I'll be using is an infusion pump, uh, which you all I'm sure are familiar with. And then I'll introduce you to model-based design process. And with the help of that uh, foundation, we'll dive deeper into the model and then also take a look at the code generation and the VNV aspects that Math MathWorks can offer with its various products. And then finally, uh, we can go into the Q&A session. So let me jump into Simulink without further ado. So for those of you who are a little familiar with MATLAB and Simulink, this must look like a familiar environment. Uh, Simulink is basically a graphical uh, environment with drag and drop aspects, uh, wherein you can pull in uh, blocks from control systems or for communication systems, radar, uh, signal processing, image processing aspects, and then create uh, different products from startup. So this is the general environment of uh, Simulink, the screen that you see in front of you. And I, for one, I call it the engineer's playground, where you can literally put together any device uh, or uh, simulate the dynamics of any component of an aircraft, etc. Now, to, to explore more about Simulink, I would definitely recommend opening up the library browser and taking a look at all of the block sets that are available to you. Uh, the first and foremost one that you'll see is the Simulink block set. You have a whole lot of uh, commonly used blocks, uh, signals and sinks, different utilities, uh, ports and subsystems to communicate with different systems, etc. Uh, my personal favorite is uh, Simscape, which is down here. And this will help simulate different physical components in the real world, like resistors, capacitors, DC motors, et cetera. And today, uh, most of the presentation, the demo and the content that I'll be talking about will be centered around Simulink and Simscape. So let's get straight to it. The example that we have in front of us is an infusion pump. So this begs the question, what exactly is an infusion pump? Uh, for those of you who are a little unfamiliar, it's a device that's used to deliver medicine uh, to the patient in, in different uh, healthcare settings. And the neat thing in this example is that I'm able to take all of the Simulink and Simscape components and simulate the behavior of the dynamics of an infusion pump at the click of a button. So just by hitting run, I'm able to take a look at how the system behaves. 
So let me pull up these two scopes for you and um, we'll see what the system does. So what we see here is the motor speed and the delivery line pressure. Now, with the infusion pump, one very crucial aspect is that aside from the fact that it can deliver medicine at regular intervals, it should also be able to detect any issues with uh, the delivery line. That is, if there's an obstacle in the delivery line, whether it's a blood clot or an air bubble, or even if the line itself gets knotted, uh, this tends to be a little life-threatening to the patient. And therefore, it's very important that we identify that uh, obstacle. We're able to simulate all of those features under one uh, example on in, in this one platform of Simulink. So in this scope here, you see that there's a constant rise and fall in the delivery line pressure, which indicates that uh, every time there's an increase in the delivery line pressure, the medicine bolus is being delivered. And once the medicine is completely delivered, the pressure falls back to equilibrium again. You'll, you'll notice that this is in tandem with the motor speed as well, uh, which simply indicates that every time uh, the infusion pump is programmed to deliver, there is an increase in the motor speed and therefore delivery line pressure. Now, the cool thing about simulating any model is that you can also think of what if scenarios that will happen in the real world. And that exactly is the aim of model-based design. So you'll see that we can simulate the occurrence of an occlusion or an obstacle in the uh, delivery line. And therefore, uh, we can program the infusion pump to turn off the motor when the occlusion occurs. In this situation, the occlusion is happening around uh, 50 seconds in this, in this area here. And so when, uh, when this, the software system identifies that there's an increase in the pressure, it goes on to turn off the motor and thereby turning off the entire system. So then a physician or a nurse can come and check what the obstacle is and they can get back to uh, reprogramming the infusion pump to deliver medicine again. All in all, at a high level, this is the, the most crucial and uh, uh, the, the important aspect of model-based design in that you have different components, different systems of multiple domains put together under a single platform and with the help of which you can simulate your devices before you deploy them into the real world, uh, having tested them for different what-if scenarios. So you will notice that the motor is turning off and thereby the delivery line pressure falls as well. So once the simulation is through, we can dive deeper into the model. But before that, let's just go through a few um, basics. So why does medical device development take so long and why is it so hard? And this is a crucial question that we have in today's world, given um, Given our current situation as we battle COVID-19, uh, we're all scrambling to put together medicines and also make sure that the ventilator supplies do not uh, run out. And we're trying to keep the world to be a safer place. So in, in, in terms of that situation, why is medical device development so difficult? First and foremost, these are safety critical products in that there are people's lives on the line and therefore, we need to make sure that they are very accurate and robust in their performance so they do not fail in the field. Secondly, they are complex in nature. Now, if you were to dial back about 200 years and take a look at a surgeon's ward or a operation theater, it would simply consist of a platform where the patient would lie down and the surgeon would cut them open and perform the surgery. But in today's world, with the technological advancements that we have, a simple surgical bed is, is a conglomerate of, of multiple domains, uh, make, whether it's mechanical control or electronics, uh, to make sure that the patient is extremely comfortable in, in their position. Thirdly, one of the most important things that we all are aware of in the medical device industry is the necessity to comply to regulations so that all of these devices meet a certain standard and are safe to use. And finally, seeing that as we advance with 
technological development and there are more domains to tackle and more domains coming together to create devices, we have different scientists, different engineers from various domains coming together and communicating. And this tends to be a little frictional, I guess, in that the communication between different departments is a little difficult. And that's where the time required to de develop a device uh, increases exponentially. So this brings us to the question, what exactly is the traditional development process like? With, with in, in a general uh, sense, first up, any, any team would acquire the requirements and specifications from the customer, which is, then, uh, which is then pushed forward into the different teams, such as controls, engineering, mechanical, electrical engineering, et cetera. And these folks in these different teams work together and put together the device for the final phase, which is integration and testing. Now, this is a pretty straightforward process. And in an ideal world, all of this would take place within the exact time frame that we needed to, and the device would be ready exactly when we are hoping it would be ready. But we don't live in an ideal world. More often than not, the requirements and specifications are not up to date, or they undergo constant changes based on the customer's requirements. There are constant updates or changes in formats, um, changes in the uh, level of authority, et cetera. Given that there are different domains involved in creating a single device and the teams work in a siloed manner, there is a lack of communication between the teams. And so finally, when it comes to integration and testing, God forbid that we find errors at the last minute, because if that happens, then the whole process of developing the design, uh, developing a, a device tends to be tedious and we need to rectify our errors from the beginning. That's where model-based design comes into picture to help us accelerate this process. So model-based design isn't all too different compared to the traditional development process, except that all of this process is centered around the simulation model. Having shown the infusion pump example to your folks, um, I can paint a picture in saying that your entire workflow is centered in a single environment where you can put together multiple domains and test your device from start to finish. And the neat thing is you can also hook in your requirements and specifications to keep track of the development uh, from start to finish. And once you're through with developing your model, you can actually test it on uh, a DSP system for signal processing, or even uh, think of a hardware in the loop device, or in other words, a physical prototype before you can deploy your device into the real world. All in all, your model-based design process accelerates uh, the development phases by providing you with a single environment to test and verify your medical device. Now, I'm sure having seen what model-based design process is, you are curious about what are the different industries that make use of such a process. What you have in front of you is are examples of various industries that are highly regulated in nature. Whether it's the aircraft industry or the automobile industry, all of them have certain regulations that they need to meet and comply to before they can, uh, before they have their products out in the market. So they are safe for humans to use. Now, with a focus on the medical device industry, let's take a look at a few examples. Uh, for, uh, for instance, we have Philips or Weinman, Doheny Eye Institute, etc. All of these folks have made use of the model-based design process for code generation, uh, for a single environment to simulate their products so that they can accelerate their uh, development process. And all of these user stories are actually uh, examples of companies having used model-based design and they are speaking testimonials that are put up on our website and should you have any questions about how this process is process takes place or how you can get started feel free to explore or even reach out to systematics for further questions 
and, and in general, if you have any other questions, please do post them in the chat window so we can um, answer them towards the end. Now, uh, we saw a demo, we took a look at a few slides, but now let's get into the most interesting aspect, which is breaking down the infusion pump from start to finish. In the traditional development process, if you have uh, the question of putting together an infusion pump, how would you go about it? With the process that we saw earlier, first up, we would need requirements. With the infusion pump, uh, one of the crucial aspects, as I mentioned in the demo, is that the, it, its ability to detect occlusion. And that is the, the crown jewel aspect of the infusion pump. So therefore, it's very important that we highlight that. Now this begs the question, if we need to detect occlusion at a specific time, what exactly are the number of sensors would I need? And what kind of sensors would I need? Would I need a force sensor? Yes. Would I need a pressure sensor to see the delivery line pressure? Absolutely. Would I need a water sensor, a temperature sensor, etc.? All of these would come under the specification section. And then you go on to figuring out what kind of algorithm you need to detect occlusion whether it's machine learning based or threshold based, all of that. And then finally, it brings, the, it brings you to the question, how do I test my device? Is the design good enough? And after you're through with all of these really nice steps, you finally have the hardware prototype which you can test before you uh, manufacture your device. This is where the challenge comes in. Let's say there is a new request from the customer for a different kind of a sensor or you need a different kind of a sensor. Now, having designed a hardware prototype already, you're going to have to go back all the way to the beginning, change your requirements, change your specifications, put in a new sensor, and then develop a new hardware prototype. All of this is extremely time consuming. Wouldn't it be cool if you had a single platform where you can simulate a different sensor and vary its specifications and then see how that affects your device's behavior. That's exactly what Simulink helps you do with the help of model-based design. So with model-based design, you have a single environment wherein you can simulate mechanical, electrical, uh, fluid systems, uh, or even put together control blocks and basically combine your research and your requirements into your design and uh, test, test your device for various behavioral aspects and uh, uh, what if scenarios in the real world. So now that we've taken a look at what model-based design is, let's dive deeper into the uh, device. At a high level, the infusion pump consists of the command generation module on the left, uh, this control software in the middle, and the plant subsystem, which simulates the physics. So let's dive into uh, Simulink to take a look at what exactly that is. I will get started on uh, these different block sets that we have here. And we'll dive deeper into each of the subsystems one after the other. So one of the ways to navigate through these subsystems is by using these drop down menus or simply opening up the subsystem that we have in front of us right here. So a majority of our focus will be on these five blocks here in the plant subsystem, which models all of the physical components of the infusion pump. So I guess if I were to present an infusion pump in front of you, one of the questions I would ask is, what kind of devices or what kind of components do you think would go into it? At a high level, anybody would answer a syringe or a DC motor to power the whole thing, uh, a voltage source to power the DC motor, and then a delivery line to make sure that the medicine is being delivered. So all of these are put together to simulate the behavior of the infusion pump in this subsystem. First up, let's take a look at the DC motor that we have here. When I open up that sus subsystem, we are uh, it, it pulls up this a block set in front of us. Now we have three different kinds of blocks here. You have uh, basically they're differentiable in the sense that they have different colors to them. 
first up you have the black color block which are basically all of uh, blocks from the Simulink and then you have the electrical components of the DC motor which are blue in color and the mechanical ones which are green in color. So uh, under the electrical systems we have a control voltage source and the uh, one half of the DC motor and also on the mechanical side we have a torsional spring damper system. Now these are components which uh, stem from Simsky Foundation Library and which will help you simulate different domains. And, and as I dive deeper into the model, you, can, you will observe that there are other domains that uh, work in tandem with the electrical and mechanical ones again uh, as well. This is one of the nice things about Simulink in that you have different domains that you can simulate, but also uh, these domains actually are compatible with each other so you can simulate the real world scenarios. In this instance, the DC motor is one of the most basic examples uh, because we need to cater to a, a, a whole variety of customers. So based on the requirements, you can also simulate aspects like a BLDC motor, a stepper motor, PMS motor, et cetera. And for any other details about uh, uh, the parameters of the motor, you can open up the block parameters and take a look at aspects like armature resistance, inductance, back EMF constant, uh, different kinds of uh, motor configurations, etc. So now that we've taken a look at the uh, DC motor drive, let's hop back one level into the drive subsystem. The drive subsystem is uh, modeled using the Simscape driveline blocks. We have, a, we have a simple gear reduction and the lead screw, which basically work together to, uh, to convert the rotational motion of the DC motor to a linear one. So the reason that is important is because we need to convert the rotational motion generated in the DC motor into a linear one to push the plunger into the infusion pumps reservoir. Next up is the slide subsystem. So in this, the, the, the aspect that's being modeled is slide compliance. So for any of you who've used a syringe, I'm sure you have experienced that initial force or resistance that the plunger shows as you're trying to push the medicine out. So it's very crucial that uh, we model or understand the compliance uh, the, the syringe shows because the pressure applied, the force applied on the syringe is exactly what makes sure that the medicine is delivered. So any non-linearity in its compliance could lead to an error in the amount of medicine being delivered. And we don't need that kind of obstacles when it comes to designing medical devices. Next up, we have the reservoir subsystem. And this is really cool. It's one of my favorites because um, it's got the mechanical aspect of simulating the uh, hydraulic cylinder. This block basically simulates the behavior of the interaction in the fluid of the syringe and also the syringe dynamics as well. And then finally, the crown jewel of the entire plant subsystem is the delivery line. So this, you'll notice that the blocks here are neither blue nor green like the previous subsystems, but are basically a brownish, I guess, I guess uh, mustard color. These are basically components from the Simscape fluids library, and you can simulate behaviors like uh, fluid moving through a needle uh, or tubing, or even simulate things like variable area hydraulic orifice. So the reason that this subsystem is very important to the entire model is because it's simulating the occlusion uh, scenario. So with the help of the variable area orifice, I'm able to simulate things like pinching the delivery line, which would simulate an occlusion or uh, increasing the variable area orifice in order to simulate a faster flow of the medicine. And the neat thing is I can also model aspects like fluid properties and vary the density um, and the kind of fluid that flows through the delivery line as well. Now, putting together all of these aspects of the uh, infusion pump, it's a powerhouse when it comes to simulating different kinds of water scenarios. Now that we've taken a look at the plant subsystem, let's dive into uh, the 
control aspects of this entire model. So we took a look at the plant subsystem, and now we will go into the test sequence control. I call this the brain of the entire infusion pump because it's the decision maker of this model. All of the logical aspects, um, like when the medicine has to be delivered and how often the medicine has to be delivered are all taken care of by the test sequence control. Let's take a look at the subsystem of test sequence control. At a high level, this looks like about three or four block diagrams that are extremely colorful in nature with various commands going in and coming out to, uh, to a layman. But I will explain to you exactly what this does uh, in, in, in the model. So first up, we have this long antenna coming in from the outside called command. So what exactly is it bringing in? Let's hop back one level and take a look at the entire model. So from the command generation subsystem, I am able to bring in aspects like uh, the user interface buttons, like power on, bolus type, uh, number of cycles, or in other words, how often the medicine has to be delivered, um, when there has to be a pause and uh, etc. All of these are basically user interface commands that people like physicians and nurses put in into the infusion pump. That command then goes into the test sequence control. That command coupled with the feedback from the plant subsystem make the decision making capabilities of the test sequence control extremely important. First up, let's dive into the occlusion detection section. As I mentioned before, occlusion uh, detection is basically the infusion pump's ability to detect any sort of an obstacle in the delivery line when the medicine is being delivered. It could be air bubbles, it could be blood clots, etc. Now, under this subsystem, there are three ways to model an occlusion. First up, we'll definitely need a variant source. So that you have options to model different kinds of occlusion. For instance, the first and foremost is a constant zero, which is representative of no occlusion. So therefore, if I were to choose this, no occlusion would occur and the medicine would constantly be delivered without any kind of an obstacle. The second kind is an occlusion that is tested or detected based on a threshold-based method. By putting in a few numbers, I tell my, sub, my system that, hey, this is the target at which, or uh, this is the time at which I want you to simulate an, an occlusion. And the other one is uh, a, a machine learning based uh, identification method for an occlusion. So among the three of them, we've chosen the threshold based method with the help of the variant source control block. and uh, that has what helped me simulate the occlusion event. Let's hop back one level and then go into the supervisory control unit. The second block of the test sequence control consists of state flow charts. So you'll notice that this is a little different compared to the other blocks because these two blocks are basically state flow charts which, uh, which model aspects like uh, the various states of the infusion pump, such as power on, the medicine being delivered, uh, the stroke time, etc. And these two are equally crucial in ensuring that the entire infusion pump works exactly the way we want it to work. And then finally, you have the motor controller, which takes care of aspects like when the motor has to be powered on, when it has to be turned off, what speed it has to run on, etc. All right, so at a high level, we took a look at all of um, the various subsystems and we walked through each of its features and uh, what are its commands that go into the infusion pump and what is the decision-making capabilities of the test sequence control, et cetera. Now let's dive into the nitty gritty of model-based design, which is basically uh, the code generation and the VNV aspect. So for that, I will go into the logical uh, logical subsystem of the infusion pump. Under the supervisory control uh, unit, we have the basal chart, 
So what I'm about to show you is a very important aspect of the verification and validation process that MathWorks has, has to offer with its various products. Uh, for more information on the VNV aspects, uh, definitely feel free to take a look at the documentation that you have available uh, for MathWorks uh, in, in, within Simulink by clicking this little question mark here. It will pull up the help document and you can take a look at what it does. For now, let's focus on the test harness of the basal chart. So what, what we have here is an internal test harness that will help us understand if the basal chart is covering all of the important aspects of testing uh, of an infusion pump. Now I can test the entire model for its behavior and performance for its robustness using the various VNV products. But in this instance, I'm sticking to a simple unit of the infusion pump, which is the basal chart with six different inputs. So what we have here, this block is my uh, test unit. And then I have the test assessment block, which will give details about what kind of tests I want to run. And also I have the test harness inputs, which is basically a signal builder block. So within the test harness, what exactly is happening is, I know the behavior of the infusion pump as the designer of the infusion pump model. So I have six inputs in here whether it's powering on, the medicine being delivered by basal being active. Um, I can set low limits. I can set a unit at which the medicine is being delivered. And also I can simulate occlusion uh, event with the help of this basal chart. Now with these inputs going into the basal chart, I am aware of the values of each of these inputs. So I can put those values in the signal builder block and simulate these one after the other to test the performance of my uh, basal chart. In this instance, I have six different commands or six different states that I can choose. So for first, in the first instance, I can test for an occlusion before the entire uh, pump is active. So all I need to do is with the help of the signal builder block, I can hit start simulation and take a look at how my test harness performs. So Simulink runs through the simulation to see how the test harness behaves when uh, one of the input commands is tested. And what it does is it generates a coverage report for me with all of the details that go into uh, creating the test harness and testing the basal chart. So I have information on when it was last saved, uh, what kind of a model it is, or what kind of a subsystem it is, who the creator uh, or the author is, uh, what kind of tests I ran, whether if it's MCDC and what percentage of it is covered, etc. You have various other details that you can understand as you dive deeper into the coverage report. It gives you uh, statistical details and any kind of questions that you have. Uh, the level of detail at which you render your test will all be taken care of by the coverage report. Another way to understand if your model is is doing a good job is to dive deeper into the chart. So as I open up the chart, you can see that there are some aspects that are green and some of the state transitions that are red in color. So the ones that are red in color are basically telling us that uh, they haven't been tested and that we need to run all of those steps before uh, before the test harness passes all of the all of the uh, test sequences. So for that, I go back to my higher level and open up the signal builder block and I run through all of the signals in order to test my uh, basal chart. So I, once I run through the six different scenarios, the test harness is running through powering on, checking for basal active, basal set, low limit, unit remain, and also occlusion one after the other, and then it finally gives me the coverage report. And now we can see that there's a 100% performance here. Uh, in or, or in other words, all of the six different aspects of the basal chart are basically tested to make sure that uh, the basal chart 
meets all the requirements that I set it to. And also, let me close this. You'll see that all of the transitions are green in color, which thereby signifies that uh, all of the tests have been run and our basal chart is good to go. All right, so let me close this and jump back into the test sequence control. So, so far we took a look at uh, the demo and we were able to see how this infusion pump works with its different components. And also we took a look at the VNV aspect. Now for the final step, because we're really trying close to the hour, I will show you guys the code generation aspect that model-based design um, is one of model-based design's uh, tenets. So let me open up the infusion pumps um, their sequence control model separately. And at the bottom right, I have the option to enter the coding perspective of the, uh, of the Simulink environment. So at the click of a button, I'm able to pull up another tab for on the Simulink um, tool strip and we can generate C or C++ code based on our requirements at the click of a button. So just by hitting build, I'm able to generate code and build this entire model in order to give me C and C++ code, which I can then use on any kind of hardware. So within a few seconds, Simulink is generating code with the uh, different blocks that I have here, and it creates a report uh, putting together all of the details for me. So I have different subsystems or, uh, within, within the test sequence control, I have the various subsystems. It gives me details on what those are. Uh, and there's a traceability report that will help you go back and forth between uh, each of the subsystems and different commands. We have the main.c file. And then as we go lower into the report, you can see that there are other subsystems of C files as well that pertain to the motor speed control, the feedback input, the motor control voltage, etc. And as you go deeper into the report, you'll take a look at the other details and the configuration settings that we put in while generating the code. And the neat thing here is that it has a two-way traceability where I can uh, where I can click on the block and then see what section of uh, code it, it points to with respect to the block. So for occlusion detection, all of these lines of code take care of its behavior uh, for, that, for that block. So this basically is how you can uh, generate code with the help of Simulink and its uh, various features. Having said that, uh, we can also take a look at, let's see. Um, We have the requirements perspective as well. What, it, what happens here is I'm able to link my model to the various requirements, whether it's uh, uh, doors or uh, rec IF format or even a Word document. I can put together all of the requirements and specifications that come in from the customer, link them to my model, and uh, make sure that all of the uh, requirements are met. So in this instance, I can take a look at the requirement that defines the supervisory control logic and all of the different bolus charts, motor speed control, et cetera. And the neat thing is I can also pull up the document that has all of the requirements linking uh, to the model. So things like the bolus duration, pause time, basal delivery, trigger action, etc. All of these are put together in the uh, Word document and they have been linked to the model. So with the help of requirements, uh, testing and simulating coverage, etc., you're able to go through from start to finish. That is from creating the design uh, or putting together the requirements all the way to testing and verifying that your model 
uh, is exactly representing the device that you want it to. So that, my friends, is uh, how you do model-based design and uh, accelerate the testing and developing of medical devices. So now that we took a look at all of, all of the VNV aspects, the code generation aspects, there are a few other topics that I just want to touch upon before we uh, make time for the question, the Q&A, uh, the Q&A session. So with, with a list of uh, different aspects that you saw, uh, we took a look at Simulink and Simscape. Uh, basically, all of MathWorks tools for model-based design map perfectly with the IEC 62304, and therefore that will help you accelerate your medical device development process. At a high level, today's toolboxes that we took a look at were Simulink with its various control system blocks, state flow, which uh, were basically the state machine charts as you transition from one state to the other. Uh, then we saw Simscape uh, components, which were the hydraulic, the mechanical, and the electrical domain components like DC motor, resistors, etc. And we also took a look at the VNV aspect and the code generation side of things as well. Having said that, uh, one last topic that I'd like to touch upon is one of our newest uh, uh, products, which is a Simulink compiler, which will help you share all of your models with, uh, with your customers, even though they do not have the Simulink, uh, access to Simulink software. The neat thing is you can share these web-based simulations uh, in the form of uh, applications, and then they can simulate the model that you have created and take a look at the results at their side as well. Uh, thank you. So that I guess that brings me to the end of my uh, model-based design talk. Um, thank you so much for your patience and for listening uh, as I talk about all of these various aspects. Um, Definitely reach out to Systematics or if you have any questions, reach out to me as well. If you have any uh, queries that you have, we can uh, talk about any questions that you have.